So I walked by a sign on this Thursday, and it, it said this. It said, give up on your New Year's resolution and eat more pizza. <laughs> and I had two thoughts on the sidewalk when I saw this. The first thought was, we just started a new year, right? <laughs> like, this is like five days ago. Are you kidding? We are the laziest, no good, most undisciplined society of all time. And then my second thought was this. Man. I could really use some pizza right now. <laughs> Don't judge me. Come on. You probably should judge me, actually. I deserve to be judged on that one. But at the beginning of a new year, we all start thinking about what we need to accomplish, right? About what we need to do less of, what we need to do more of, about what we need to do. <coughs> but I want to take a step back today and not talk about the what, as much as talk about the who. The do is completely dependent upon the who. What you need to do is an outgrowth of who you are and of how you perceive yourself. And so for the next four weeks, we want to talk about this concept, this idea called image. We see self-image is defined as the idea, conception, or mental image of, that one has of oneself. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can lead to confidence, it can lead to doubt. It sometimes can come from uh, your home city, it can come from your experiences, it can, can come from a parent or a family, but it often, uh, our, our own image often comes from where we came from. And so today I want to do something. I want to go back to the very beginning, to the genesis Literally, Genesis chapter 1, will you stand with us for the reading of God's word as Dave comes? Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man came to be a living being. He did. So a couple weeks ago, uh, I took my five-year-old over to the office. I had to do some work one night, and uh, I keep this stash of balloons uh, in my desk drawer for the kids anytime the kids come over. So I pulled one out, and I gave it to Renzi, and she promptly took it, and she gave it right back to me. She said, Daddy, will you please blow it up and make it a balloon? And so I took it and blew it up, and I gave it back to her, and, and the next 10 minutes were filled with laughter, excitement, joy, and she was just running all over the place. With it. It's amazing what a simple balloon can turn into in a child's hands. Now, on average, humans, you and I, take about 17,000 breaths per day. But in one moment, with one breath, <laughs> that was really loud. <laughs> A meaningless, worthless, used, youth, uh, useless piece of rubber turned into something that completely transformed a workplace into a playland. Now, Renzi, she didn't see that, she didn't see this as a balloon until my breath went into it. The material never changed. The contents of this never changed. But when my breath went into it, all of a sudden it took the form that it was intended to take. It took shape. It took purpose. It gave life and joy. It brought about possibilities and imagination. She could use it as a, as a moon, as a starship. She could use it as a punching bag, as a ball. Whatever you could think of, she could use this thing. Now, if you let air out of this thing, well, it's, it's not as useful. You let all of the air out of it. It's still a balloon. But you can't use it for its intended purpose because there's no breath within this. And so what do you do? You have to put breath back into it. Some of us 
might be here in the point right now that I'm coming to. Maybe you are here today and you feel a little bit deflated in the house today. And you feel like my, I'm not performing my intended purpose. I'm not living up. I'm not taking shape. I don't know who I am. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on God. It's never too late to be who you might have been. He has not given up on you today. It is not too late. He has plans and purposes for you. And guess what you need? Just a little bit of breath in your lungs. Just a little bit of breath of God to come into you and make you who you are called to be. We see in the scripture, at the very beginnings of our collective story, we were what? We were dust. At the end of our story, what will we be? We will be dust. From dust to dust. From ashes to ashes. All of us will go there. But in the middle, in between, God comes along. And he breathes into the dust. It's this Hebrew word that we see, ruach hokadesh, which means the holy breath of God. And he, God breathes into that dust, his holy breath. And we come to a different being. We, we take the shape that we were supposed to have. We begin to find the form in the, that we were intended to have. And we start to begin to release possibilities into the people and the places around us when the breath of God enters into our life. Maybe you need God to breathe into you today. Yeah. Who's here and you need God to breathe into your soul today? Yeah. Yeah. Something happens when you allow him to breathe into you. Two things happen. Number one, you find a new level of confidence. Number two, you find humility. Amen. Both things happen. Here's what Professor Abraham Heschel, a scion of the great Hasidic masters, once said, he said, man is a polarity of a divine image and worthless dust. He is a duality of mysterious grandeur and pompous aridity, a vision of God and a mountain of dust. It is because of his being dust that his iniquities may be forgiven, and it is because of his being an image that his holiness and idealism is expected. So together, image and dust express the polarity of the nature of man. We are formed of the most inferior stuff. Yet, we are called and made in the most superior image. So, Father, we just pause right now to come before you in prayer. I pray, God, that you would breathe truth into our minds today. Breathe love into our soul and our heart today. Breathe life into these bones today, we pray. Amen. Amen. Notice the very first sentence in the passage that Dave read for us. It's verse 26. It says, let us make mankind in our image, our likeness. It's a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit creating. We were created out of relationship for relationship. I think even on a physical level. It didn't take one person to create you. It took two people coming together in relationship, and you were we were created out of relationship for relationship. That is part of our intended purpose, a part of our story. Our Genesis story has profound importance. Do we understand this idea? Our beginnings, our origin has profound impact on who we are, on how we see ourselves. The rampant image problems in our society don't result from a lack of designer clothing or a lack of makeup or a lack of trophies. They result from a separation, from a walking away from the story and from the creator God who breathed life into us to call us out of isolation, to call us into relationship with him and with those around us. Augustine wrote this. He said, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until it finds rest in you. And so we go on a search. But instead of relating to God and others, we relate to things and creation. And we learn to use people and to love things instead of loving people 
and using things. And we start to worship the, the created instead of the creator, instead of him who brought us into existence and brought us into life. What are we doing? We're stepping away from our origins. We're forgetting our story. We're losing. We're becoming disconnected with him who created us and with those who are in his image. Verse 26 says, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, we are different than animals, right? Mostly, usually, we are different than animals. If a lion mauls a deer, the lion police don't show up. There is no lion investigator that comes. There is not an autopsy that happens on that lion. A lion does not get mad at another lion for murder. So a lion can't murder because a lion is just being a lion. An animal is just being an animal. Now, humans are different. We are created in the image of God with a conscience to rule over all creation. We are separated by God. He sees us as different. He sets us apart, if you will. For five days, God creates. And after each day, what does he say? He says, and it was good. And then he gets to day six, and he, and he creates his crowning achievement, man and woman. And he steps back, and for five days he had done this, so it's good, 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 good. And then he stops and sees man and woman, and he steps back and he says, behold, very good. You are set apart. Do you know that? You are made in God's image. Verse 27 so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Imago Dei is a Latin phrase that's used for this concept, and it means the image of God. The Bible, uh, the Bible project does a good job of breaking down this concept. If you live in ancient, or if you were to live in ancient Bible times, you probably would be under the, under the rule or authority of a king. Now, many kings saw themselves as deity. They communicated themselves as gods, and so they would tell you what to do. They would tell you what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. And oftentimes, they would make their people build a statue, erect a statue unto them. It's this word, the Hebrew word selim, which means idol or image. And they would raise up these statues. And Now, Israel was quite different. Israel didn't see their kings as gods. And they weren't allowed to make any statue or image about God at all. It was quite, it was very distinct and unique from other cultures in that time and in that age. Now, there's a number of reasons. First, they didn't believe that the creator God could be diffused into one image or one idea, but there's another reason as well. People aren't to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. Yeah. And they're in this room. They're walking around. They're all around us. What makes us us? Well, like our creator, we create. We work. We have a sense of humor. We think, and we think about what we thought. We have imagination. We reason. We worship. We relate. We have a conscience. These are things that we do, but, but don't focus on the do. Focus on the who, right? So who I am in God then relates to what I do. Instead of focusing here on the outcomes, focus on who we are. And when I step into the presence of, when I know who I am, I'm made in God's image, it changes things in my life. When I step into prayer and I'm connecting with God through prayer, all of a sudden I find uh, creatively an idea that can come and bring reconciliation to that relationship. Work. When I understand myself in the image of God, it's, it's not a punch card anymore. No, now it's a calling. It's a ministry. It's a mission. When you step into God's presence and you find his peace, don't you find it easier to laugh? You release. You let go. But the beauty is that God didn't just take one or two 
or 10 people and, and make them important. No, he took all of us and he put his image on every single one of us. And this is the whole idea of the Reformation. It was built out of this because you had the scriptures that were chained to the pulpit during the Reformation. And only one or a few priests were allowed to read that and interpret it for the people of God. But what happens during the Reformation is a chain is broken and the scriptures and the word of God is released to all God's people. And there was an understanding that from the priest to the garbage collector, that every single person, no matter where you are or what you do, that who you are is a treasure. You are the, the imago Dei, the image of God projected to those all around you. We all bear something of God within ourselves. At the reconciliation luncheon over the Southeast White House and 84-year-old 84, 84 man named Reverend Hackney will often show up, and people call him Rev. And uh, he'll come, and every time he comes, he has to tell his testimony. This is an old testimony, too. 1964, he was on the streets. He was homeless. He was an alcoholic. He lived in the bottle. He was a drunk, in his own words. And... Reverend Sam Hines came along, a longtime pastor in D.C., and he would feed him when he was drunk. And here's what he said. Uh, here's what Rev said about Sam. He said, Sam didn't see me as an alcoholic. He saw me as a great possibility. I was just trying to get away from drinking and smoking, but he saw in me God's work, and God's work got in my heart. I haven't touched alcohol ever again, and I've been serving the Lord ever since. We start with, I need this, and I need that, but just get around God. You have to go through something to get to something. If you haven't been tested, you don't got a testimony. Listen to what he says. He says, it's not the power of who I am or what I did. It's God in me. But God is in you. So feel free to look inside me, but, but you better look inside you too. I kept asking Rev about himself. And he kept telling me about God. And so I pulled, my, I, I pulled my iPhone out at the end, and I flipped it open. I just caught the very end. It's pretty rough. It's not much. But I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what it looks like to have a 52-year-old testimony, and it be so fresh. Check this out. Who, who are you? Who am I? I'm a child of the king. I'm not bothered about who I am. I am bothered about whose I am. Mm. And I'm God's child, just like you and everybody else. I was just trying to ask his name for the video so I could actually have his <laughs> name on the video. <laughs> and he gave his name, didn't he? He gave his name. Your new nature, your nature will be no greater than your thought. Here's what God says in Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, to give you a future and a hope. The future is not a time. The future is not a date. The future is a thought. We're not searching. We're not waiting for the right day to come. We are waiting for the right thought to come into us. It's a revelation of who we are in Christ. Sam Hines called out a thought over an alcoholic one day. And he called out the image of God in a man, a, an image bearer of God. Some of you have been called worthless. Some of you have been called meaningless in your life. You've been called dumb or lazy. You've been called witch. You've been called a mess up. You've been called all kinds. Of, but I want to tell you something today. Those words are not you. That's not your name. Your name is holy. Your name is set apart. Your name is love. Your name is loved. Your name is prescribed through the image of God. And if you bear the image of God, it brings great meaning and worth to your life today. Do you know that today? His image is on you. When you begin to break down self, you're breaking down the image of God. Some of us need to hear this today. We can't understand the true worth that is on our existence. Now, some of us here are in a different place. We understand that we are made in the image of God, but you know what? We don't like the image that we were given. We want to have that image over there. 
We want to be that person or have those giftings or bear that image. Just be you today, okay? That's who you're called to be. And God made you for a specific reason. And when he breathes into you, what happens? You take the intended form and you bring life to everybody around you. That's his calling over you and he will breathe it into existence. Some of us here have lost our way. We've allowed culture to define our sense of self. Take it back. Take your mind back today. Start a, new, start a new way of thinking. Let's have a fresh start. Last week we talked about uh, a fast that we want to try. So for the next 10 days, starting today, January 8 through 18, we're going to fast. You might want to fast TV. You might want to fast food. You might want to fast fast food. You might want to fast radio. You might want to fast coffee. But find something that you want to fast. To put it in, psych- in uh, psychology terms, it's a pattern interrupt. I like what Pastor Heather said last week. She said, fasting really just means silencing the voices that are loudest, suppressing the yearnings that are strongest, and removing the distractions that are noisiest so that the voice of God can be loudest, our yearning for him the strongest, and his will the clearest. When we begin to see ourselves and others as image bearers of the king, imagine what could happen to our marriages. Imagine what might happen in our neighborhoods. Imagine what might happen in racial tensions. Imagine what might happen in our government. Imagine what might happen in our relationships, in the way that we care for the poor and the refugee. We are to treat everyone with sacredness. Every person that bears the stamp of God matters to God and to us. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. We have built our society on this foundational and fundamental understanding and concept. Look at the second sentence of the Constitution of the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now, what happens when we get away from a Genesis understanding? We'll look back to our country again. 1857, there was a landmark case called Dred Scott versus Sanford. And Dred Scott was suing to become a free man. The Supreme Court of the United States, with a 17 to 2 vote, essentially said this. They said, because you are an African American. You are not an American system. There, uh, uh, excuse me, an American citizen. Uh, therefore, you cannot receive the benefits of our justice system. And so, seventy. This is what happens when we step away from the Genesis. But listen to what one of two of the dissenters, a guy named John McLean, what the justice. Listen what he said in dissent. He said this: A slave is not mere chattel. He bears the impress of his maker, and he is destined to an endless existence. The Imago Dei is the argument against slavery. Made in the image of God, not mere possession. He's a man. That was the argument. Now put yourself in political and social arguments for just a moment right here. I want to help you feel good about yourself, okay? Have warm feelings right now, don't you, okay? You're in political and social arguments situations, and you're with a person that sees things drastically different than you. You're in that situation, but what if you began to see them as an image bearer of God? How would that change the tone? How would that change the course of your account? How would that change the way you see them? I, I put this on myself, I need to understand and appreciate. I need to learn more, not just learn more. I need to celebrate those who are different than me. And guess what? Every single person is different than me. All of us have a great calling in the midst of this. Is your job to call Rev an alcoholic? Or is your job to call Rev to call out the image of God within him, to dust off the image that, that could be that is underneath the surface and call into existence to bring about possibilities 
and those who God has put in our path. It's the Imago Dei. When we are, see ourselves and those around us made in the image of God, it changes everything about what we say and what we do and the way we see things. You can see why someone gets so passionate about racial injustice because they want everyone to be treated as image bearers. You can see why someone gets so passionate about an unborn child because they believe that there is a unique imprint on that unborn life. You can see why people uh, work so hard for refugees, for the elderly, for the prisoner, all because the marginalized are just as important as high society in God's eyes. We take the chain, we break the chain. Every single one of us is an image bearer of the king. Some of us just might need to dust it off a little bit and allow God to breathe into us. We look and judge people as though they are dirt. But God, he has breathed into that dirt. And every one of us, our image bearers are beautiful, and we are called to be a beautiful reflection of that image. Think of a mirror. How does a mirror reflect the sun? Well, you have to turn the mirror towards the sun. When it's turned, then it reflects it. How do we reflect the image of God? We turn towards the sun. We turn our eyes. We turn our face towards God. And Psalm 67, 1 says, God will make his face shine upon us and turn towards us. It's, uh, this weekend is the, it's the anniversary of my dad's passing. And so I find myself in this very reflective mood. So bear with me for just a moment. Reflect. For a minute here, I think back when I was younger and, and people would tell me how much I looked like my dad. They'd say, man, you, you uh, talk like your dad or you look like your dad or you act like your dad, you pray like your dad, or you walk like your dad, your gait is like your dad. It was like everything was like, and I, and I couldn't stand it, right? It's like I cringe when somebody tells my kid they look like me because I'm like, oh man, they're going to hate that. <laughs> and... Uh, and I really do feel bad. I was praying that they would look like their mom, so I don't know if prayer's working in this situation. I, didn't, I, I wanted to distance myself from my dad. Now, 19 years after he passed away, the only thing I want in this world is to look like my dad, is to act like my dad, to be like him to laugh, to worship like him, to pray like him, to walk like him, to treat others like him, yeah. to seek God like him. And you know what? I had, a, I had a season there where I couldn't appreciate or understand my origins. And maybe some of us here today don't understand or appreciate our origins. And you know what? Maybe you had a bad dad. But you know what? It's not your earthly dad that gives you your origin. It's not my earthly dad that gives me my origin. It's our heavenly father, creator God, who gives us that. And I found this, that a good father knows his good, good father. Come on, come on. That's what makes a good dad. That's what makes a good father. That's what we're going to sing about. Take a moment. My, the, the favorite poem of my father was, was called The Touch of a Master's Hand. And it talks about the worth of our life when when we are not dust alone, when God breathes it, and when we are put in the touch of the master's hand, it changes the worth and the value of who we are. And as I read this in closing, I want to ask you just to consider. Will you just consider? Are you giving accurate value to your life? Who you are? Are you giving accurate value to the lives, to the people around you? Will you just consider that? As I read this, and then at the end of it, and worship leaders at all of our locations, if you go ahead and come right now, and I'm going to end this poem, and we're just going to go into a simple song and ask that God might show us, breathe into us, and reveal who we are in him. The touch of a master's hand. 
"'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two, two dollars, and who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no.'" From the room, far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings. He played a melody, pure and sweet, as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars, and who will make it two? Two thousand, and who will make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand what change it's worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand, and many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin, a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone, but the master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand.